Welcome to Rural Remix, your source for deeper, richer stories about life in rural places. Where do horror movies happen? Small towns, dark forests, cornfields, and farmhouses have each been the locations for iconic scary films. But why are rural settings so popular, and how do these choices affect the areas represented? The Rural Horror Picture Show is a five-part series that explores the often flawed but always interesting depiction of rural people and places in horror movies. Today we're talking about folk horror and how the genre uses rural places to illustrate modern tensions between science and the supernatural. Welcome to the Rural Horror Picture Show. I'm Susanna Brown. I'm Anya Patron Slepian. And happy Halloween. Yeah, happy Halloween, Susanna. <laughs> yeah. Anya is back leading us through a very exciting discussion today. But as we do, we're going to start with a fun little intro question to get us into mm-hmm. the spooky mode, which, Anya, I have to ask, mm-hmm. what is your favorite classic movie monster? So, like, I'd say, like, not too specific, but general form a monster can take. What are you into? What do you like the best? Yeah, I mean, I think I have to go with something which, you know, maybe maybe fairly obvious may also be a bit on the nose for this episode. I love a witch. I think witches yeah. are fun and I like witches whether they are good or bad, right? Mm. I do not care if the witch is the protagonist or like actually like the villain villain of a movie. Yeah. Wicked Witch does fabulous things. You must love The Wizard of Oz. There's so many witches. Love The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, I mean, we, we grew up absolutely watching The Wizard of Oz kind of all the time. I think it was my older sister's favorite movie. Amazing. And there were a good three years of her life where she would only wear ruby slippers. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it's so probably fun. what it is, is like this this origin story of like younger sisterhood. But yeah, I don't know, which is our cool, which is our historical, which is our feminist, mm-hmm. um, which is have great fashion. Totally. Yeah, I think I think that's probably mine. What about you, Susanna? Well, also love witches. You make a great point. Mm. I think I'm going to go with vampires. Okay. They're kind of sexy. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're fun. <laughs> I was going to ask Twilight vampires or other vampires? You know. All vampires. I'll take a Twilight vampire, but that's not my, my first choice. Okay. I like that there's a lot of rules <laughs> for vampires. <laughs> that's I think that's true. funny. <laughs> they yeah. just like got a lot of things they can't do, and I think that's amusing. Yeah, no, it's like this crazy supernatural being, but very limited in yeah. specific ways. <laughs> and I think that's huh. important for yeah. obstacles to exist. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. The whole entering a space thing is, is a good one. Yeah. I agree. Sunlight, mirrors. Garlic. Garlic. Yeah, a lot. Can't eat steak for whatever reason. Well, I don't think we'll be talking about vampires today, unfortunately, but we might be talking about some witches. Yes. Yeah, Anya, what are we talking about today? Yeah, today we are talking about the genre of folk horror Mm -hmm. and a couple American movies that fit into the genre enough for me to talk about them. Amazing. (laughs) Is folk horror not typically American? Folk horror is originally a British genre that sort of mm. began in the 1960s and 70s. We like British things that yeah. quickly <laughs> cross the pond into American cultural <laughs> consciousness as well. This is according to a really great documentary called Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitch, mm, yeah. which is a three-hour history of folk horror, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really good, and I recommend it. One important thing for our purposes to know about folk horror is that it is sort of inherently rural. Mm. There's this historian... Paul Cowdell, he writes that one important characteristic of folk horror is, quote, a fantasy of rural separation and remoteness as a locus for the preservation of the arcane and the sinister. Mm. And here also is sort of a quote from the documentary, Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, which describes something similar. Someone heading to a village just outside of town and discovering a pagan conspiracy. He's something like pre-Christian, something that's surviving in spite of the dominant culture. Rural locations, insular communities, these old superstitious beliefs that tend to breed around these communities, which are seen as being backward in in the past. You're outside of modernity, isn't it? It's really all about outsiders being outside of civilization and realizing that you're really a smaller part of this wider cosmos. 
Yeah, so that's definitely something we've talked about before, we've mm-hmm. heard before. This uh, separation, this kind of idea of being seen as backwards. We've talked about that, I think, in almost every episode of right. this show. Uh, this is Urbanoia played out yet again. So I'm curious, because we've been talking about American movies and you've been giving us this British background in full core, what does it look like in the American version? What are the differences? I would say that American folk horror has sort of the same underlying tensions of Mm. British folk horror, but what we're worried about is a little bit different, right? And so British, very concerned about witches. Americans are also concerned about witches because we had the Salem witch trials. There is that history and that sort of cultural presence. Sure. But instead of paganism and these old pre-Christian practices being the main source of religious or superstitious stress. In the United States, we're more worried about what somebody in the documentary calls, quote, weird Christians. Mm. (laughs) So early colonial settlers were, by definition, sort of weird Christians, and that tradition has continued uh, strongly (laughs) in the United States. There are a lot of different types of all religions and also different types of Christianity, yeah. and some types of Christianity originated sort of in the United States, Mormonism being being that one. Mm-hmm. But there are also more fundamentalist groups that we could think of, like the Mennonites, the Amish, mm. even the Shakers. So one element of our folk horror is sort of this fascination with and fear of uh, what we would define as weird Christians, uh, which also overlaps with cults sometimes. Mm-hmm. And when we think about some of these groups, Amish, Mennonites, and Mormons, they're also all associated really strongly with rurality. Mm. So that sort of helps loop things back into the folk horror narrative. I would say that the other tension of folk horror that's really important, and this sort of overlaps with occult movies, and the occult can be defined as any sort of spiritual practice that is not really bound by organized religion think witches, think Ouija boards, Mm. that kind of thing. So something that all occult movies have in common, whether or not they're rural, whether or not they're considered folk horror, is this tension between modern science and the old ways. So modern science versus magic. And very, very commonly, that tension is played out by the protagonist, who is generally a white man and a white man of science, of logic, of modernity. And he has to figure out what's going on, uh, which is generally magic, right, or in some form or fashion. And he has to both come to believe in the magic and then learn how to solve the problem in a magical way because the scientific explanations and scientific solutions aren't working. Mm. And that is sort of the fundamental plot line of all of these movies. Yeah, that's super interesting because it feels like we have this like urbanoia trope yet again of you know, one modernity versus lack of. But what's really interesting is you said that the modern science man needs to learn to believe in the magic. And that feels so Mm -hmm. different from what we've been talking about, because there's no, you know, the canoers and deliverance didn't learn to understand the ways of local people. That Mm -hmm. wasn't what was happening. So I think that it's a similar tension, but this interesting, like, you need to solve it with the magic with the supernatural in some way is so interesting. I'm excited to see how it plays out in these movies. Yeah, totally. And it's, it's sort of making the argument that supernatural problems require supernatural mm-hmm. solutions. So sink or swim, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, really good point that it is similar to Urbanoia and sort of like any other horror movie, like the killer hillbilly trope, they all have the same underlying tension within their little subgenre but the politics of the movie can still be read by how these things are handled. And that brings us to our first movie, which is Children of the Corn, Mm. released in 1984, adapted from a Stephen King short story that was published in 1977, I think written in 1976. Mm -hmm. And this one is really interesting to talk about because the short story and the movie are different Mm. in really meaningful ways that ultimately affects the message that you, you walk away with. Okay, so what is going on in this movie? Yeah, so the movie is about a couple named Bert and Vicky. They are a young couple. 
Bert is a doctor. He is a man of science, as you as you see. Vicky mm. is his partner, who we don't know what she does because it doesn't matter. Because it's 1984, <laughs> and who cares? She's so pretty, but she's pretty. <laughs> and they are driving through Nebraska on the way to his medical internship, and they're sort of fighting. They're not getting along that well. It's clear that she wants to get married and he's sort of like Ugh, I just need to do my medical internship mm-hmm. and so they are driving through miles and miles and miles of corn fields mm. but this monotony is broken in a dramatic fashion when a young boy stumbles into the road and Bert runs him over womp, womp. so obviously they're freaking out that's no good but they look closer at the body and they see that his throat has been cut so that's not a car injury his throat was cut before he ran into the road mm. and so they go to look for help and the nearest place is a place called Gatlin and when they get to Gatlin they realize that it's empty like there is nobody yeah. there it's eventually revealed at the very beginning of the movie actually and at the in the middle of the short story that some time ago all of the children of this community murdered all of the adults they murdered anybody who was over the age of 19 mm. and they did it in the, in the movie, it's shown with poison and knives and, like, field tools. Gruesome. Yeah, super gross. <laughs> and they did yeah. this because there is a entity called He Who Walks Behind the Rose, and he demands it. Mm-hmm. And so, long story short, Bert and Vicky are attacked by the kids in the movie. They manage to sort of fight back and deliver speeches about rationality. And then with the help of some of the kids, they are able to burn down the cornfield and therefore defeat he who walks behind the rose. In the short story, they are gruesomely murdered and sacrificed. <laughs> he walks behind the rose. Tough. And they die. Whoa. That is a, a big difference. I mean, just having the the fates of our main characters be so mm-hmm. <laughs> completely opposite. I am curious as to why that change was made. Maybe just more enjoyable to watch a movie where things end okay i don't know maybe yeah so what did you have any sort of first impressions or thoughts about this movie yeah this movie is really interesting it's creepy in different ways than a lot of the Mm -hmm. ones we watch i think that's sort of the classic children are scary you know i'm thinking about the the twins from the shining like yes the a chucky doll like that kind of little kids doing something creepy is extra creepy extra scary i don't really know I'm sure there's you can do a whole analysis on that, but <laughs> you just don't expect evil from them in the way that you might expect evil from an adult. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's some really strong, scary children in this. Good uh, child acting, some notable, uh, good job being scary. I also was kind of obsessed with how they depicted when we finally see, <laughs> when we finally see he who walks mm-hmm. behind the rose, just an awesome... 1980s uh computer graphic of a monster oh my god it really made me feel so much less afraid yes (laughs) yeah for anyone who hasn't seen this movie i mean this 80s graphic i mean it just like is this super pixelated sort of (laughs) red and yellow something it's like not really a flame quite that sort of like engulfs people just like emotion it's 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 so awful and like the movie is genuinely creepy yeah, at points. And at that point, yeah, you, you totally lose it. I mean, even in 1984, I cannot imagine this being something that people were impressed by or afraid of. Despite the depiction of the monster not being that scary, there were like really creepy, scary things in there. Like the attempted crucifixion of Vicky was really just freaked me out. Mm-hmm. I found it jarring. And yeah, I mean, certainly sort of the weird Christianity you were talking about seems really prevalent in this movie. Yeah. What was going on with how religion was represented? Yeah, yeah, good question. This is a textbook case of weird Christianity. There are all sorts of biblical things going on. All of the kids have taken on biblical names, so they used to be called something else, and now they're called Job and Isaac and Malachi and, you know, Mm. sort of these old-fashioned biblical names. They also are shown in the movie to be rewriting the Bible. Obviously, crucifixion is a super important part of this. The kid who is killed, initially, they find in his suitcase sort of a corn cob crucifix. Mm. 
So yeah, Christianity is clearly the starting off point for this, but it, it does differ in some critical ways. Uh, you know, once again, the historical context of this short story and film. Yeah. So short story is written in the mid to late 70s. The film comes out in 1984. And this is an era of televangelism has become really popular. It's gone mainstream in a lot of ways. Mm. During the Reagan administration, there's a very active group of televangelists who formed what they call the moral majority. Mm. And there are all of these personalities who are really famous. They're TV stars, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson. They have a huge following and they're very active on the national stage politically. And something that this movie really does is that it's very interested in critiquing religious fundamentalism, but they're also really interested in pushing sort of this evangelical moment out into rural, which is not historically what was going on. There's this great scene at the beginning when they're driving down the highway and they turn on the radio and they're already sort of setting themselves up as they are clearly the urbanites who have no interest in some disdain for this place already. They think it's boring. Um, And they turn on the radio and sort of this is what they hear and do. I spy, my little eye, something that begins with the letter C. Corn. Right. So now we know. Back roads are even less interesting than the highway. Maybe they've discovered music. Yeah, and so you can hear immediately they're setting themselves up, first of all, making fun of the of the preacher, um, but also setting themselves up. They are college graduates. They are people who watch public television. Yeah. They are not rural evangelical Christians. But once again, you know, this is sort of a fallacy. This sort of evangelical religiosity is not at all confined to rural places. Absolutely. It wasn't in the 70s and 80s. It isn't now. There is some really great reporting by a Daily Under reporter, Sarah Malott which shows that rural people are not necessarily more likely to attend church than urban people. Basically, every other demographic difference is a stronger factor than whether they live in a rural or urban area. But we all have this perception of rural places as be having more churches per capita and being inherently more religious, uh, when actually people's real life religious practices do not differ widely depending on whether they live in rural or urban places. I think that's a really important point because I feel that that is a perception so common. And I think a lot about, you know, when we see this young couple and they turn on the radio, I mean, I feel like I've experienced something like this of on a road trip and you see those billboards that are, you know, Mm -hmm. call this number to be saved. And I think those very clear signs of religion are often you see on a road trip, maybe you're driving through a more rural area, things like that. And I certainly know I've had misconceptions about what religion is like in an urban versus rural environment. So I think it's important to like examine that and and think critically about it as opposed to just sticking with what is maybe commonly told or taught. Yeah. And I mean, also just if we think about certain types of evangelicalism, the megachurch, right? These churches Mm. that have thousands and thousands of people, they're not predominantly rural phenomenons. The biggest megachurch in the United States is in Houston with 43,500 weekly visitors, right? Of course, evangelicalism and fundamentalism are not necessarily the same thing. Sure. And Children of the Corn came out the same year that the original Footloose movie came out, right? Mm. And that is another small town situation, which is not dissimilar from what these kids do. They do end up outlawing music and toys and games and anything fun and modern, not unlike the Footloose town. But the difference is you never expect the children to be the one who are like, no music, no fun. And in Footloose, you know, the kids, the kids want to dance. And in Children of the Corn, the kids are the ones stopping the fun, which I guess, again, goes back to the When children are evil, it's scarier. (laughs) Yes. And the other thing that this movie does, it's pushing evangelicalism and fundamentalism out into rural, um, but it's also conflating these actually genuine, quote unquote, weird Christian groups like the Amish, like the Mennonites, 
which are pacifist groups True. and portraying them as sort of inherently violent, right? Mm. Because these kids are doing a lot of things that these groups do and believe in like sort of the ban on technology and things like that but they're using scythes and knives and all sorts of little farming tools to hunt and try to kill and sacrifice uh, our two protagonists yeah i also watched that three hour long documentary and mm-hmm. one of the things i really felt like was a big takeaway from their description of full core is that change is what is scary like change in traditions change in weather change in communities Mm -hmm. because like a lot of time they're talking about uh i think the word they used was hauntology like this idea of Mm -hmm. an unresolved past coming back Mm -hmm. uh to haunt you whether like a social or cultural past and i think it's really interesting in this movie an unresolved past of christianity kind of being stuck in a different time there's something about going back to the old biblical names but like a distorted version of of christianity that really feels like it's kind of this hauntology this change is scary taking a religious thing and distorting it making it not pacifist not Mm -hmm. normal and i think also the way that it sort of addresses the fundamental tensions of folk horror is twofold one is that burt makes this plea at some point where he sort of he's figuring out the religiosity of all of this Mm -hmm. and he's like whoa 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 this isn't how religion should be and he sort of makes this logical plea here it is just because some self-proclaimed holy man said this is what god commands what kind of a god tells his children to kill their parents huh answer me that buddy i can't believe you're this blind maybe you've been listening to these holy rollers so long It's all started to sound the same. Well, it's not. Any religion without love and compassion is false. It's a lie. And so he's saying that sort of while he's in the circle of the children, they're trying to sacrifice Vicky. He's trying to, you know, cut her down and and escape with her. And he makes this whole plea and then is immediately confronted with Isaac, who has been killed and then repossessed by he who walks behind the rose. Um, And so he says, this isn't real. Uh, And then he sees it with his own eyes and he sort of goes, oh, and he and Vicky run away. (laughs) Yeah. But he does in the end, in the end of the movie, embrace what's going on enough to fix it. He realizes that one of the adults previously who had been killed had been trying to kill he who walked behind the rose based on sort of an extrapolation from a bible verse right so you need the bible verse to sort of point you in the right direction the right direction is burning down the field which it feels like maybe you could have figured out without the bible verse but importantly in the movie that is what he uses to get there um so that is sort of him embracing that you have to sort of get on their level um in order to solve the problem so like in the short story since you said they don't survive is there not an embracing of Mm -hmm. the religion for them yes exactly so so vicky pretty much is immediately carried off and sacrificed gruesomely her eyes are gouged out she's yeah it's gross and she's crucified bert survives longer and sort of was trying to save her but is wandering through the rose and he comes upon the realization that he who walks behind the rose is real and is sort of out to get him because he's just killed by him but what's interesting is that the story doesn't end with Bert and Vicky being killed it returns to the children Mm. where he who walks behind the rose is displeased with the nature of the sacrifice of Bert and therefore lowers the, the acceptable age that you can live to from 19 to 18 so everyone who is 18 going to turn 19 has to go sacrifice themselves and it sort of returns this uneasy peace between the children and he who walks behind the rose who who they serve interesting in the short story there is no reckoning and notably even with the help of the bible and embracing the magic bert and vicky in the movie drive off with their two favorite children yeah you know presumably to form a happy nuclear family and returns the world of science and logic and medicine because bert is a doctor and in the short story they failed to bend They've failed to figure out what's going on, not that there was really much of a chance for them to, and they're just dead. And this Mm -hmm. dark, demonic presence in this town 
continues as it has been going for 10 years. Interesting. And you're sort of left with the feeling that it's still out there somewhere, which again is very different reading from the triumph of science uh, and logic, which is what happens in the movie. <laughs> yeah, a triumph of science and logic, but aided through a Bible verse. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. In the movie, right, it's enough for him to figure it out. But it's not enough for there to be this complete conversion, yeah. right? It, you don't get the feeling that his way of life has changed forever now. It was he was dipping his toe in. Yeah, he hasn't <laughs> embraced anything truly. He's just opened a Bible. Right. <laughs> yeah. He cracked it open for a spin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll dive into more examples of folk horror after this short break. Hi, I'm Janie Carey with The Daily Yonder. Check out The Yonder Report, a weekly podcast rounding out the latest rural news produced by The Daily Yonder and Public News Service. You can listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. So Anya, are there other good examples of folk horror in American movies? Yeah, there are so, so many. We're only going to talk about one more today, but this one is a really fun one that also is pretty iconic. It is the Blair Witch Project. I love the Blair Witch Project. (laughs) Yes, Blair Witch Project is so much fun. It is so famous for so many reasons. It is sort of the movie that popularized the found footage or sort of mockumentary style in horror movies, Yeah, which is now something that we've seen for decades. But this movie came out in 1999. Mm -hmm. There's this title card at the beginning of the movie that sort of introduces the premise. It says, in October of 1994, three student filmmakers disappeared in the woods near Burkittsville, Maryland, while shooting a documentary. A year later, their footage was found. And so something really notable about this movie wasn't just the movie itself, but the way that it was released. About six months before the movie came out, the people who made it hired a web designer uh, because this is 1999 (laughs) to make a website and on this website there are missing posters of the three actors who who use their real names and so it's trying to convince people that these people really have gone missing while trying to film a documentary and people really, really believed that actually this was real footage and that the people had in real life gone missing. Yeah. It's one of my absolute favorite movie lores. Like Mm -hmm. their marketing techniques were so creative and unusual and Mm -hmm. they really convinced people. It was so effective. And I think it's one of those things that's a little hard for us to imagine now. Yeah. There's so much on the internet and we are so, I mean, I wouldn't say that we're all do a perfect job of sifting through what's fake and what's real. But there's a skepticism about what is on the internet now that I think they probably couldn't get away with it today, but they're the first people to ever do it. uh, And so it worked. And there are, I mean, you know, people who went to see the movie in theaters at the time, not all of them, but certainly some of them genuinely thought it was a real experience, which fundamentally transforms the way that you watch any movie, never mind sort of in a cult or folk horror movie. Or at least were confused and not totally sure if it was real, which even that Mm -hmm. slight hesitation, confusion is enough to drastically change a viewing experience. Yeah, totally. And so a brief description of what happens in the movie is that these three students are trying to make a documentary. They go around and interview the townsfolk of Burkittsville before heading off into the woods. Things sort of start happening at night and they escalate more and more. And then they realize that they're lost They've lost their map and they sort of are wandering around the woods for a few days as things get progressively creepier. And in the end, presumably they die, but you never really see anything really on camera other than sort of weird stuff that they're finding in the woods. You hear noises, but you never see the monster and you don't know exactly how it happens, but you know enough to know that they do not make it. Yeah, I love the fact that you don't see the Blair Witch, you don't see what's scary. And I think it's a really Mm -hmm. good contrast to Children of the Corn (laughs) because we talked about how sort of unscary it was once we saw He Who Walks Behind the Rose. But it's almost, I think it just adds a lot to the the folk horror, the folklore of it, right? Because you Mm -hmm. don't see it, it remains unresolved. And it adds to this audience speculation and confusion because it's still unknown. And I think we'll Mm -hmm. talk a lot about this 
in our next episode of what that means for an audience to think that something is maybe real and to think and to have no real answers or visualization Mm -hmm. of what is scary. Yeah. And also critically that Burkittsville, Maryland is a real place. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I think something about this movie is that it does fit a lot of general folk horror conventions. It's set in the woods. It's about an old supernatural force, specifically a witch, which again, we've already talked about why we have those. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a local story or a local secret. Townspeople don't necessarily believe in it, but they believe in it enough to not go into the woods. Yep. And some of them do say openly that they've seen it. Um, And there is also an urbanoia element to all of this, right? They are not from here. They go into it. And in fact, for a good part of the movie, their explanation for what's going on and what's happening to them is that the locals are messing with them. Yeah. They also have some takes that could be argued as sort of from an eco lens. Heather specifically keeps on repeating that it's impossible for them to be lost in the woods for that long. There's simply not enough natural space, Mm. natural resources left in the country these days for anyone to really get lost in the woods, which is patently untrue, (laughs) but does sort of have that environmental narrative. Yeah. And the thing about these three filmmakers who are there is they are skeptics. They Mm -hmm. are, the take is very much, you know, They're rational, they're logical, they're modern in the sense that they're literally, you know, with their technology and their camera Mm -hmm. equipment into the woods. They don't believe in the supernatural. They're going to make this documentary about it, but it's filled with skepticism. They're ready to to kind of make fun of the situation until they're hit in the face with it. And then the fear sets in, then the realization. But it takes that Mm -hmm. reckoning, awakening of being literally forced to believe it. Yes, which is sort of the fundamental tension of folk horror, right? And I mean, to the point about them being skeptics, they they meet a woman who says, I've met the Blair Witch. This is what I saw. And the next scene is them in the car making fun of her. Yeah, it's almost like their documentary they're trying to make is look how silly these believers are and not an explanation really into the the lore of it. But if their journey from skepticism to belief is what this occult folk horror movie is all about and what every occult folk horror movie is all about this movie i think went several steps farther than maybe anyone ever has or anyone ever will again because of the fact that so much of the initial audience did believe that the movie was real and so that doesn't mean that you're watching from a safe distance like you are with children of the corn and watching bert's sort of transformation from skeptical man of science to somebody who now has to confront this fear You are watching these people in your mind really, really do it, which means that you, the audience member, are also at the same time Mm. genuinely confronting this supernatural thing that you have no explanation for. Yeah. And the filmic technique of it is that because it's found footage, Mm -hmm. you are literally forced to identify with the protagonist because you only see what they see through the camera. There's no wide shot where you see them you only see what they're filming and sometimes you see them filming themselves and like i mean the iconic shot that's on the movie posters is heather sort of looking at the the camera selfie style very close up when you can like see fear in her eyes but other than that you're Mm -hmm. looking out and seeing what they're seeing forcing you to identify with them and it's really effective in the terror of it all Yeah, well, because it's also really, really limiting because what are they seeing? Not necessarily that much, um, but enough for them to be scared. And it also differs from other sort of traditional horror movie, especially storytelling techniques, which rely tremendously on dramatic irony, right? The tension is that you, the audience, know something's out there. You've seen it and you can see them not knowing. And that's what so much of... Children of the Corn, for example, mm-hmm. relies on the opening shots of the movie show sort of the massacre of the adults. And then you go to Bert and Vicky, who have no idea, and you know something's wrong, but they don't. And in this movie, you are discovering that something is wrong. I mean, you know that something's wrong because you know it's a horror movie sure. and you're going to watch it, right? But that is all that you get as opposed to in a more traditional movie where you might have seen the Blair Witch or you might see them sort of stumbling towards the abandoned house where they eventually are killed and you would have more information than they would and in this movie that is not the case and if you were an original 1999 audience member you maybe don't even have that oh you know you're watching a horror movie element because you think you're watching found footage Mm -hmm. so even that component of it is gone yes it is so these movies have really 
different settings. And I think it's been really interesting to see how they're both folk horror, but in pretty starkly different ways. But the thing they have in common, as all the movies that we're talking about on this podcast do, they're rural. Yeah, they are. And I think that's something that we're seeing in doing this podcast is that there's so much overlap. These are rural folk horror movies. They're also urbanoia movies. Yeah. The Killer Hillbilly movies were also urbanoia movies. Mm -hmm. And the mutant cannibal element of The Hills Have Eyes is a little more sci-fi, I would say, than it is occult. But these movies are separate. And the reason that we sort of separated them out is because they are both movies with a genuine supernatural element. Yeah. Whereas the rest of the movies that we watched excepting Jennifer's body, which of course also has a supernatural element. (laughs) But the rest of the movies that we watched were sort of about scary rural people with no added element of magic or belief. These are different, but at the same time, they still follow so many of the other things that we've been seeing from the urban people coming into the rural area and also especially the location of backwards, creepy, scary things in the rural place as opposed to the urban place, which represents progress Yeah, like it always seems to. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much, Anya, for walking us through these two great examples of movies, explaining folk horror to us. I feel like we got to dive into a whole new genre and talk about Supernatural, which is really exciting. You're welcome. Thank you for hanging in there with me. And I do think that Children of the Corn especially gives new meaning to, you know, those sort of icebreaker questions when your coworkers are like, how many children could you fight off? Um, or like, how many five-year-old yous could you take on? And my answer wasn't that high to begin with, but after seeing sort of like the religious fervor and that they all have sides, I'm like, none. none. <laughs> Maybe two. Wow. Uh, you're better than me. I don't know if I could, I could take them. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, we'll, we'll see you next week for the sort of real life consequences of rural horror movies. Talk to you then. The Rural Horror Picture Show is a production of Rural Remix. Original music was composed by Quincy Ponvert and Leo Pozel. Cover art for the series was drawn by Nat Nichols. Thank you to our executive producers, Joel Cohen and Adam Georgie, associate producer, Teresa Collins, and the staff of The Daily Yonder and Rural Assembly. This series was edited and produced by Susanna Brown and Anya Patron-Slepian. <laughs>